Ladies and gentlemen, the President and Vice President of the United States, accompanied by Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles, Senator Tom Daschle, and Representative Richard Gebhardt. Good afternoon. First and foremost, uh, first and foremost, I'm just plain happy to have a job today. <laughs> but I'm also very proud to be here in this historic setting with each of you as we come together to forge what will truly be the new ideas for a new century. Of all of the issues that face us as we turn the clock towards the 21st century, few will be as important as health care. Today, together, we are taking an important step towards giving American families the health care security that each and every one of them need. It is my pleasure to introduce to you someone who has been a solid leader in making health care more accessible and more affordable for more Americans. Someone who has been a real partner of this administration as we have worked together to meet the challenges of a changing health care system. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce House Democratic Leader Dick Gephardt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me first say how pleased all of us are that Erskine still has that job. <laughs> Let me uh, say I'm very happy to be here today with President Clinton, Vice President Gore, Tom Daschle, Senate Democratic Leader, my colleagues from the Senate and the House, and Secretary of HHS, Shalala, and Deputy Secretary of Labor, Higgins. We are here to reassert the commitment of Democrats to meaningful managed care reform. Managed care, when it's done well, is a useful tool and positive influence in health insurance. It can control health care costs, at least to some extent, and it can provide beneficiaries important preventative and wellness services. That's why it's so important for us to ensure that every American who enrolls in a managed care plan gets first-rate managed care with the benefits, quality, and protections that they expect and deserve. When Americans enroll in managed care, they don't expect to give up their access to the high quality health care that's made America the envy of the world. And they shouldn't. When Americans enroll in managed care, they don't expect to lose their working relationship with their doctor or to lose control of decisions regarding their care. And they shouldn't. The other day, here in suburban Virginia, I got to see the movie As Good As It Gets. If you saw it, you probably remember Helen Hunt's character's frustration with her chronically ill son's HMO. You know the magnitude of the public's shared frustrations when her outburst in the movie prompted cheers and applause from the movie audience. I've never seen it in my movie-going experience, and I've had many tell me that in other movies around the country of showings of this movie, the same thing happened when she delivered her line. Managed care is a large and growing part of our health care system. It's time for managed care companies and managed care plans to be made accountable for delivering quality care and respecting basic consumer rights. In this way, we can turn a useful tool into an effective vehicle for the delivery of first-rate health care that will attract more and more 
satisfied customers, and everyone will benefit. That's why it's so disappointing and, yes, outrageous for some in the Republican leadership to be actively working with special interests to stop managed care reform in its tracks. The prevention of managed care reform is part of the extreme Republican agenda that caters to the short-term interests of some in the business community and that opposes the federal government's protection of the rights of individuals in the name of conservative ideology. It is right for the federal government to ensure that all enrollees in managed care have access to quality care, as well as meaningful rights and protections as patients and consumers. American citizens expect their federal government to serve them in this role. Empty promises of voluntary codes are not enough. And as many thoughtful business people will tell you, this is also good for business. When people have problems with their managed care plans, it's serious. It's disruptive to them both personally and as workers. Individual productivity suffers, and employers find themselves devoting increasing resources to intervening on their employees' behalf with their managed care plan. High-quality managed care plans that deliver appropriate services and ensure the rights of their enrollees do not create this drain on individuals or on their employers. President Clinton has been an outstanding leader on behalf of managed care reform for all Americans, as have many of my colleagues here today. I look forward to working with them to ensure that all managed care plans are high in quality. And if necessary, I'm looking forward to fighting the opposition of the Republican leadership and their special interest allies to sensible managed care reform. It's now my privilege and pleasure to turn this over to my friend and colleague from the Senate, the Democratic leader of the Senate, Tom Daschle of South Dakota. President, Senate Democrats, and I believe the American people applaud your leadership on this issue. Last month, Democrats in Congress held a hearing on managed care. One of the people who testified at that hearing was a woman who works in an oncologist's office. Her job is to verify insurance coverage and get authorizations for surgeries and procedures for people with cancer. She talked about a 12-year-old boy who had a cancerous tumor in his leg. The doctor wanted to perform a procedure that would have saved the boy's leg, but the health plan refused to cover it. The only procedure that they would pay for, believe it or not, was amputation. The boy's parents appealed that decision and were turned down. They appealed again and they were turned down again. Finally, they appealed to the highest level, the medical director of the plan itself, but he too denied treatment. The woman in the oncologist's office suggested that the boy's father talk to his employer, since he was actually the one paying for the health insurance. Once the employer got involved, the procedure was approved and performed immediately. But by that time, four months had gone by and the cancer had grown so much that the boy's leg had to be amputated. There was no other choice. That is just one example of the kind of personal tragedy that we mean to prevent by passing a patient's Bill of Rights this year. This is literally a life and death issue. It is an issue that touches more families every year. Today, three out of every four working, insured Americans are in some sort of managed care arrangement. If you're not one of them now, chances are you will be soon, whether you get your health coverage through your employer or from Medicare. By passing a patient bill of rights, setting national standards, we can make sure that all insured Americans have the same right to health care, no matter what plan their employer chooses. 
how that plan is funded or what state they may live in. We're certainly not opposed to managed care. But what we are opposed to is to managed care plans that cut corners and deny needed health care in order to maximize profit. Democrats in the Senate have been working for some time on a patient's Bill of Rights, which we will be introducing shortly in the next session. We're encouraged by the bipartisan support this idea has already picked up in the House. And we hope we will be able to build a broad coalition of support in the Senate as well. It's bad enough that there are 41 million Americans today without health insurance. But it's outrageous and intolerable that even people who have health insurance today can be denied needed health care. We want to change that. Mr. President, Senate Democrats will continue working with you and the Vice President on an ambitious agenda for the coming year. In many areas, we will face opposition from an array of special interests. That is the case with our topic today. It also appears to be the case with tobacco legislation. But let me be clear. I do not support the negative view that Senate leaders, including Senator Lott, expressed today on the prospects of a tobacco bill. While the opposition may be formidable, our resolve will overcome those obstacles. We will pursue a vigorous course, which is clearly right for our country and best for our kids. It is now my pleasure to introduce someone who has been on the forefront of our health care efforts and someone we can count on in the fight to make the system more affordable for all Americans, our friend, the Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm very proud to stand here with President Clinton and Leader Dick Gephardt and Leader Tom Daschle and our, our colleagues in the House and Senate who are standing up here with us, and so many uh, advocates from the private sector and from public interest groups that have been so uh, influential and prominent in helping to press for health care reform in America. Thank you all for being here. And allow me on behalf of the President to acknowledge uh, briefly the individuals who are with us here. Uh, Erskine uh, uh, has already spoken, but I want to echo Dick Gephardt's uh, comments about uh, there being more than one person who is uh, happy that uh, he still has the job he has here. And uh, to Secretary Donna Shalala, who has been a tireless advocate for health care issues, and Deputy Secretary of Labor Kitty Higgins, who works uh, so effectively for working families. And to our colleagues, Senator Byron Dorgan uh, is of North Dakota is here. And uh, from the House, Congressman Vic Fazio, Congressman Bob Clement, Congressman Jim Davis, Congressman Barney Frank, Congresswoman Diana DeJet, Congressman John Dingell, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, Congressman Martin Sabo, Congressman Pete Stark, Congressman Robert Wexler, Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher, Congressman Henry Waxman, Congressman Mike McIntyre, McIntyre Congressman Bob Wagand, Congresswoman Pat Danner, Congressman Lloyd Doggett, Congressman Ed Markey. Uh, we got a, a lot of unity here today, obviously. And what is bringing us together is a proposal that the President is putting forward here today that Democrats support almost unanimously. And as Tom Daschle mentioned, a lot of Republicans support as well. Their leadership does not support it. But the rank and file uh, is divided with, I think, the majority uh, uh, tempted to come over and support us on this, because it's good for the country. And people understand that it has to be done. But what I'd like to do before presenting the President is briefly put this into the context of the last five years. We've made steady progress since President Clinton has been in this White House to improve both the quality and the availability of American health care. The fight for quality health care has always been a core democratic issue, and that's why we have fought to make health care more portable so that when people move from job to job, they can take the health insurance with them. No child should lose his or her health insurance just because that child's parent 
loses a job or moves from one job to another. Those core values also led us to extend health care coverage to five million uninsured children in last year's balanced budget agreement who would not have otherwise received health care coverage. It's also the reason why we're right now fighting to expand access to Medicare coverage for the near elderly who need to be able to buy quality health care without uh, making impossible sacrifices and we want to do it as a country without unraveling our hard-won fiscal discipline. So we're all united on, on these values and we've made great progress and so now is the logical time for the next step and that means talking about more than access and talking about the quality of health care. Everybody knows that during the last few years we've seen truly astonishing changes in the way Americans receive their health care. And today more than 100 million Americans are enrolled in managed care plans. And there have been a lot of benefits from managed care plans, but our challenge is to ensure that the lower cost of today's health plans doesn't come at the expense of lower quality in the health care that is delivered. We want to protect the patient's rights to demand and receive high quality health care. Enacting a health care consumer bill of rights really is about common sense. You hear that phrase uh, a lot, but it's at the heart of what's being talked about here today. If you're paying for health care, you're not just paying for some procedure that's described on a, uh, a computer program. You're paying for something that's designed to, to get you well and improve your health. And so the quality of what you're receiving ought to be taken into account in the transaction whereby you pay for it. But if the actuaries uh, and uh, the accountants are the ones in effect making the decision about what kind of care is given in return for the payment, that's no good. And it's absolutely unacceptable. And so we have to remedy that. As many of you know, uh, uh, in March, uh, I will present to the President the report of our Health Care Quality Commission, which will outline additional steps that we are taking to address this issue. And um, as I mentioned, it shouldn't be any surprise that Democrats are united in our determination to give every American these crucial protections. The entire Democratic leadership is united, and let's not kid ourselves, it's a good thing we're all united because it's going to be a fight. The opposition started criticizing and opposing before the details were even announced. One uh, special interest lobbyist said last October when we started talking about this, and I quote from one of the newspaper articles, he said uh, that we need to start fighting like we're in a war. Well, <laughs> we don't think it is a war, but if they want to make it one, <laughs> we'll certainly be ready for them. And they're going to be surprised at how many Republicans come over and join our side in this battle because the American people want high quality health care. So our message is clear. Democrats stand for quality health care and basic rights and protections for hardworking families. And I predict that by the end of the year, we're going to win this. And now um, I'm very pleased uh, to present the individual who for five years has been calling our nation to address this issue. I want, I want to also uh, uh, mention the tremendous work of the First Lady in addressing the issues related to health care. And from the very beginning of this administration, President Bill Clinton has told this country any agenda for the future of America is incomplete until we address this issue responsibly. And he is the leading champion of quality health care for our nation, President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Gebhardt, Senator Daschle. Mr. Bowles, thanks for hanging around. That will minimize our health care bills around here, I can assure you. I thank the members of Congress for being here and uh, Deputy Secretary Higgins and Secretary Shalala. I'd like to especially thank uh, two members who are here, Congressman Dingell and Congressman Stark, for their leadership on this vitally important issue. If I could just very briefly, I'd like to put this issue in uh, to the larger context of what we're doing as a nation at this moment in history. If you look at the history of America, I think it's fair to say that we have not only survived but prospered and gone increasingly stronger over 200 years because we have found a way at every moment of challenge and change to make the adjustments necessary to preserve our enduring values in a new set of circumstances. And we have done it by strengthening our union and by applying the elemental principles of the Constitution and the fundamental values of the country to a new time. That's essentially what we're being called upon to do today. I have said for six years now that to me, all of our policies should be able to be explained in terms of three words, opportunity for all, responsibility from all, and a community that includes all Americans. Now we know that because of the changes we're undergoing and the way people work and live and relate to each other and the rest of the world, the way all our major systems work, because of globalization and the revolution in information and technology, that we are having to systematically reform virtually every major institution of society. We've dramatically uh, reformed the way the government works. It's as small as it was now when President Kennedy was here. And I would argue it's uh, doing more with greater impact in a positive way. We're in the process of trying to create a system of lifetime learning in America, opening doors of college to all Americans, and raising the standards of our schools and trying some different things that have not been previously done before. We're trying to help people balance work and family. That's what the Family and Medical Leave Act was all about, and raising the minimum wage and the earned income tax credit and all those things. We're trying to make sure we can preserve the economy, uh, preserve the environment while we grow the economy. And I would argue that we've demonstrated with a different approach, you can do both things quite well. But all of this requires, anyway, a, a sense of purpose to make sure that nobody gets left behind and that we really do change our institutions that protect the public interest as circumstances change. And that's basically what all these stories are about. I mean, the, the, the story that uh, Mr. Gebhardt told from the movie, As Good As It Gets, that I remember very well, too, uh, is basically a story of a hardworking woman who's doing everything she's been asked to do by this country, gets up every day, goes to work, doesn't make a lot of money, obeys the law, does her best to take care of her kid, it's done what she thought was right to provide health insurance to her child, and the system's not working for her. That means that we have not succeeded in reform. Yes, we made a lot of progress in health care reform, but we've got a long way to go. I think we were right to, uh, <clears throat> to propose to extend uh, Medicare coverage to people who can buy into it, who are over 62 and have lost uh, their health insurance, or people who are over 55 who've been uh, downsized or promised health care that uh, they didn't get from their companies. I think that's important. But this is really important. Why? Because so many people are in managed care, and there are so many stories like the one that Senator Daschle told. And again, I would say to you, to me, this can, what we should do can be answered in terms of those three little words I've tried to drill into the American consciousness for three years. You say to managed care people, okay, we have to reorganize the health care market, and you want the opportunity to sell your policies, okay? You have that opportunity. You now have the responsibility to make sure when you sell a policy to somebody, they get quality health care. And we have to have an American community that's as healthy as possible. So it hurts us all if people are shelling out money for health insurance policies, and they and their children can't get the right kind of health care. We are all diminished by the story that Tom Daschle just told. That's not the America we want to live in. That's not the America we want to represent. That's not the America we want to lift up to the rest of the world. Now, that's what this is all about. 
So I know there will be objections to this, uh, but there are objections to every time you want to make a fundamental change. You know, there were objections to our efforts to get the budget under control. It was supposed to, the deficit was supposed to be $357 billion this year when I took office. It's going to be less than $23 billion, and next year uh, we'll offer a balanced budget. I mean, I'll offer one this year for next year, and we'll have it. Uh, there are always objections to anything you do, but the point is we couldn't go on doing what we were doing because it was unacceptable. It violated our notions of responsibility. We were depriving too many people of opportunity, and we were clearly undermining the future strength of our American community. Now, that's the circumstance here. We simply cannot go on, given we all know people who run managed care plans are under pressure. We know that we've had, uh, we finally succeeded, uh, thanks in some measure to managed care, in taming the inflation beast in health care for the last few years, and the people that run these plans are under great pressures now. We understand that there may not be easy answers to all these things, but the bottom line is you cannot justify putting people who pay their insurance premiums and are working hard and are trying to take care of themselves and their children at the kind of risk that so many Americans are at risk of today because they don't have the consumer protections that ought to be elemental in a society like this. And we have to pass this bill because of the dramatic reorganization of health care relationships in America. And we're either going to do it and strengthen our sense of community and strengthen our future, or we're not. Now, do we all need to listen to what the practical problems are? Should we have a good debate? Of course we should, but the fundamental truth is everybody knows that this is a public interest issue, that the people who are in these plans cannot protect their own interests unless they band together as citizens and unless their elected representatives create a framework in which they can get the health care they deserve and that they're paying for. That's the fundamental truth. You can argue about the details till the cows come home. We have to make this change because of the changes in the American health care market. And I have been very heartened by the fact that many members of the Republican Party have expressed support for similar actions. And I'm hoping that we can, can get a big bipartisan vote for this bill. But if you look through that, throughout the 20th century, the mission of our party from the beginning of this century has been to push the changes that need to be made to preserve the basic values of this country in new circumstances. That has been our mission. And we are here today together to fulfill that mission. I believe we'll succeed. I hope we have as much Republican support as possible. But every person here and every person that will hear about this in their heart of hearts, I don't care what they do for a living or what their uh, position might be, their immediate financial interest, Everybody knows there have been dramatic changes in the health care delivery system in America that require a change in the framework of protection for ordinary citizens, and we are determined to give it to them. Thank you very much. I hear we've got, and we got a shouting contest here. It's a shouting contest. Do you, do you believe Iraq when it says that it is not experimenting with biological weapons of human beings? Well, I don't know what the facts are, but I think the Mr. Butler's concerns are clearly what justifies the inspection regime. In other words, no American has to decide whether he or she believes Iraq or not. And no American can possibly know whether Mr. Butler is right or not because all he said is he wants to take a look-see. There is a framework for inspections. I'm very encouraged, by the way, that we got a good statement out of the United Nations Security Council today. It is clear that the international community knows that Saddam Hussein is doing the wrong thing. And we have got to remain steadfast in our determination to continue the inspections process in a non-political way where uh, the leader of Iraq does not get to determine who, when, and what is going on in that inspections process. I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that we ought to be able to find out. That's what the UN resolution says.
how seriously should people view the possibility that the Iraq is exposed on human beings? Well, if Mr. Butler says that he believes that justifies the inspection regime. In other words, no American has to decide whether he or she believes Iraq or not. And no American can possibly know whether Mr. Butler is right or not because all he said is he wants to take a look-see. There is a framework for inspections. I'm very encouraged, by the way, that we got a good statement out of the United Nations Security Council today. It is clear that the international community knows that Saddam Hussein is doing the wrong thing. And we have got to remain steadfast in our determination to continue the inspections process in a non-political way where uh, the leader of Iraq does not get to determine who, when, and what is going on in that inspections process. I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that we ought to be able to find out. That's what the UN resolution says. To assess the credibility of those allegations. How seriously should people view the possibility that Iraq is exposed to human beings? Well, if Mr. Butler says that he believes that he's got enough to go on, we should view it seriously enough to insist that the inspections go forward. We shouldn't, we don't want to, we don't want to do them like they've done us, like they did the, the head of the inspection team, the American head of the inspection team, where they accused him of being a spy. And, you know, we didn't even, uh, the United States government doesn't even know who's on what team from a day-to-day -day basis. They're all picked by the United Nations. Uh, so we don't want to convict them uh, in advance. But if there is enough evidence for Mr. Butler to say that, then he ought to be able to go look. I would remind you that in 1995, they admitted having stocks of uh, chemical and biological uh, weapons potential that were very troubling, that they admitted. So that's, that's another reason we've got to keep going and continue these inspections. That the, this is a case where the United Nations actually had it right. They've got a good framework, and we just need everybody to stiffen their, uh, their resolve now so we can go back and do our jobs, and we have to be absolutely resolute in insisting that it be done. Thank you very much.